appointment. And from now on. So thanks, Dominique, also for agreeing to record this seminar. Thank you. Please go ahead as when you are ready. Okay, I think you should be able to see my slides, right? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Thanks a lot for the invitation. It's really a pleasure and also an honor to give this uh, first talk in this upcoming seminar series. And uh, as you explained, this talk will be on exploring the implications of muon G minus two for physics beyond the standard model in the energy range, which is also of interest for a planned E plus E minus collider. So at the moment in particle physics, we have uh, this situation indicated here, uh, represented by maybe the two extreme cases, G minus two and LHC. So G minus two is of course an experiment and an observable, which happens at very low energies uh, with extremely high precision. G minus two is really one of the most precisely calculated and also measured quantities in particle physics. It's a leptonic static, quite simple quantity, which is uh, known at the 10 to the minus 10 level. The relative precision is 10 to the minus six or 10 to the minus seven in the future. Uh, on the other extreme, we have the Large Hadron Collider, which has the highest energies available to us at colliders. It has hadronic initial states, which are more dirty, uh, but we have access to a highest energy processes. And uh, at the moment, as you know very well, of course, uh, in G minus two, we have this tantalizing deviation between the measurement and the standard model prediction. The significance is right now about 4.2 standard deviations. And on the other hand, at LHC and at many other past collider experiments at lab Tevatron and so on, essentially all measurements agree in an excellent way with the standard model predictions. And so somewhat in between, there would be a e plus e minus collider. It has of course a leptonic clean initial state, maybe not the same high energy as the LHC, but uh, almost as high. And so it could test in a very promising way, many of the potential new physics explanations of the current G minus two result. And this is basically what I will focus on in this talk. So mainly the talk will be given from the point of view of G minus two. I will explain you um, what the situation is in general terms and then focus on quite a few uh, specific examples uh, of uh, beyond the standard model um, explanations and beyond the standard model ideas, which are of interest um, in the context of G minus two and uh, will then indicate how this relates to E plus E minus colliders. So let us begin with the basics. I guess you are familiar with this, but nevertheless, let's uh, uh, simply state that of course last year there was really an enthusiasm in April when the Fermilab experiment published the first result of their G minus two measurement. And uh, the result had a prehistory, namely in 2006, there was already another experiment at Brookhaven National Lab in the US. And there, there was already a tantalizing deviation found between the standard model prediction and the experiment. Uh, at what it was at the level of three sigma and therefore it was uh, motivated to repeat the experiment uh, with higher precision and that is what is done at Fermilab where the muon infrastructure is better than it used to be at Brookhaven therefore the ring was transported to Fermilab and um, the experiment is now running and uh, the results that we are talking about today are the results from the run that was taken in 2017. So that was run one. And in the meantime, there has already happened run two, three, four, and at the moment, uh, run five is ongoing. And so therefore in the next few years, the experimental situation will further improve. And so at the moment, there is already this 4.2 sigma discrepancy. In absolute terms, the deviation is at the level 10 to the minus nine, uh, more precisely, um, 2.5 times 10 to the minus nine. What is the definition of G minus two? So G minus two is, um, as I said, a simple quantity. It's a static property of the muon. It's the anomalous magnetic dipole moment. And so what we write is uh, there is a G factor, which is the uh, strength of the magnetic dipole moment in natural units of uh, charge over two times the mass. And then G is dimensionless and it can be written as two times one plus A mu 
and a mu is the anomaly of the deviation from two to or g minus two over two, which is the quantity of interest. And so it is experimentally quite uh, simple to access, at least in principle, of course. Uh, namely, you put a charged particle into a homogeneous magnetic field, and then on the one hand, it performs a circular motion, and the circular motion has a frequency that you know from E over M determinations. The frequency is given by E over M times the magnetic field. On the other hand, uh, the magnetic uh, field exercises a torque onto the magnetic moment, and therefore the magnetic moment and the spin performs a precession, and the precession frequency is given by G over two times E over M times B. That means the difference between these two frequencies is directly proportional to G minus two. And so by measuring the difference between these two frequencies, you have a direct access to A mu or G minus two of the mu. The only other quantity that you need to measure precisely is the magnetic field, and then you can directly access G minus two, and that is what is done in the experiment. So uh, from the definition, you see that G equal to two is uh, special for the measurement, and uh, maybe you also remember that from classical electrodynamics, G equal to one would also be a special uh, value because that is the value that you obtain in classical electrodynamics for a homogeneous charge and mass distribution. And so here we are interested in the value of G for a relativistic quantum particle, namely for the muon. And as you know, uh, there we get G approximately equal to two, but not quite equal to two. And the difference is a measurement of quantum effects of uh, standard model physics. Therefore, it's very interesting um, for particle physics. So in theory, um, G minus two is described as follows. You have these Feynman diagrams where a muon interacts with a photon. In other words, a muon interacts with a magnetic field. B are loops. And so calculating this Feynman diagram gives you various um, uh, terms in the result and you can do a covariant decomposition and you can write the result in terms of an effective Lagrangian. And then you will find one term in an effective Lagrangian which looks like the second line here where you have psi bar psi connected with sigma mu nu times the field strength tensor f mu nu. So this term really describes the interaction between um, magnetic dipole moment, um, which is proportional to the spin of the particle times the magnetic field in relativistic notation. So uh, you can extract the coefficient of this effective Lagrangian from calculating the Feynman diagram and then G minus two or A mu more precisely is given by this coefficient here uh, times the muon mass and some other prefactors. You can also extract the electric dipole moment from the imaginary part of the same coefficient, but that is not uh, our topic here. What is interesting for us also for the rest of the talk is an um, in a connection between G minus two and uh, the muon mass. Because uh, the muon mass is, is written in the first line also in a Lagrangian where you also have just a psi bar psi term. And uh, the similarity between G minus two and the muon mass is that both terms and both operators in quantum field theory connect left-handed and right-handed muons. So these are what we call chirality flipping quantities and that chirality flipping nature of the two influences very, very strongly the phenomenology and the rest of our discussion here. So this um, can be expressed in terms of a symmetry breaking. So you could associate to the right-handed muon, for example, a phase a rotation, psi right goes to a phase times itself. Then uh, the muon mass and G minus two, they are both not invariant under this chiral symmetry. So they correspond to chiral symmetry breaking or chirality flipping. And at the same time, uh, both terms break electroweak gauge invariance because they connect the left-handed and the right-handed muon. And of course the left-handed muon is part of a doublet. The right-handed muon is a singlet and therefore in order to generate the muon mass and also G minus two, you need a Higgs. You need a Higgs vacuum expectation value which breaks electroweak gauge invariance and only then you can generate G minus two and the muon mass. 
So these uh, symmetry properties and symmetry breaking properties are really shared between G minus two and the muon mass. And so the two um, quantities, which are obviously both of very high interest, uh, share a lot of properties in uh, phenomenology. From this discussion, we can get something like a very um, rough but generic formula, how you can estimate AMU in many, many uh, models, um, both in the standard model and in uh, physics beyond the standard model. Namely, from the definition uh, in red here in the third line, you see that the definition contains an explicit factor of the muon mass. So that appears here in the front. And then uh, all the other factors here in this formula come from the Feynman diagram. And so as I said, we need a breaking of electroweak gauge invariance. Therefore, uh, the Feynman diagram must be proportional to some vacuum expectation value of some Higgs boson which breaks electroweak gauge invariance. Then we need a breaking of chiral symmetry. Therefore, in generically, we always need some parameter in the theory uh, which uh, governs this breaking of chiral symmetry, which generates a left-right flip between the muon. And uh, then there could be all sorts of other couplings and uh, for dimensional reasons, there must always be a mass square suppression. So this formula is the general formula, which is true in all models that we will discuss. And so just as a comparison in the standard model, of course, you know how the muon mass is generated. Namely in the standard model, we have one single Higgs vacuum expectation value and the muon Yukawa coupling. And this muon Yukawa coupling in the standard model is the one uh, this parameter which breaks chiral symmetry and therefore these green factors in the standard model are of course known and they are simply the muon mass itself. So generally speaking, uh, therefore we have the red factors, the green factor and the blue factors and these green factors in some models is just uh, equal to the muon mass and then the G minus two contributions would behave like muon mass square divided by some other mass square times couplings, very simple contribution. But in certain models, the green factors are different and um, may be enhanced. And those are models where you have additional sources of electroweak symmetry breaking, additional sources of flavor structures, additional Yukawa couplings. In other words, very interesting models. And those models are the ones that we can investigate via G minus two. So some words on the standard model and physics beyond it. So here, of course, you have a cartoon of the standard model. You know that the standard model is a very deep uh, theory resting on very fundamental principles like relativistic quantum field theory, gauge invariance, and spontaneous electroweak symmetry breaking. It contains uh, quarks, leptons, gauge bosons, and the Higgs. And, uh, contains precise predictions about all the interactions of all these particles. And G minus two of the muon is sensitive really to all aspects of the standard model. It is sensitive to all particles and all forces. And this sensitivity comes via these loop diagrams. In other words, via quantum fluctuations. But there are questions uh, that lead us to consider physics beyond the standard model. And of course, uh, open questions include Dark matter, we know that dark matter should exist, but we don't know what it is. And for sure, it's nothing contained in the standard model. And there are conceptual questions like, what is the origin of generations? What is the origin of quarks and leptons? What is the origin of the Yukawa structure and the Yukawa values uh, of, of governing all the masses uh, of the standard model fermions? And there are, of course, many questions related to the origin of electroweak symmetry breaking. What is the origin of the Higgs field of the Higgs boson? What sets its mass and the energy scale of the Higgs field? These questions are also the topic of the LHC, but they can be investigated via G minus two, and of course, also via an E plus E minus collider. So there is a lot of complementarity there. So let me uh, explain Feynman diagrams which contribute to G minus two. I will not give a full overview of the standard model theory prediction here. I have it in the backup slide. So if you want uh, to ask me, uh, feel free to do that. 
but uh, let me first give a simpler overview here. So for sure you are familiar with the fact that the Dirac equation from relativistic quantum mechanics predicts G equal to two, and that corresponds to this three level Feynman diagram here. Then the simplest one loop Feynman diagram uh, contains a photon exchange that was calculated by Schwinger. And it gives the leading contribution to AMU, uh, namely alpha over two pi. And so alpha over two pi is one per mil approximately. And so uh, AMU is uh, the leading term is one per mil 10 to the minus three. Now I stressed before that all standard model particles and interactions contribute. So let me highlight this here. So for example, what about the Z boson? In this Feynman diagram, you can also have the Z instead of the photon. And then you will get a contribution indicated here in red. It is roughly speaking, it is the same alpha over two pi prefactor, but times a mass suppression, namely muon mass square divided by the Z mass square. And that fits to the generic formula that I had on the previous slide. We always have such a mass square suppression. And uh, here the muon mass square appears because this chirality flip and electroweak symmetry breaking in the standard model generates uh, a factor of the muon mass. And so uh, working out this uh, muon mass square over Z mass square gives 10 to the minus six. Therefore, overall, we have 10 to the minus nine. And that is really the contribution of the standard model Z. And in general, this is the contribution of electroweak inter or weak interactions to G minus two of the muon in the standard model, 10 to the minus nine. And um, as I mentioned, the experimental sensitivity is 10 to the minus 10. Therefore, uh, we can resolve the standard model weak effects. There is more to standard model weak effects. So here is a Feynman diagram, which contains the two heaviest particles that we know, namely the Higgs and the top quark. This is a special class of diagrams, so-called Z Feynman diagrams, where the Higgs um, couples to a top loop. And uh, in this way, you have actually a Higgs to gamma gamma sub diagram. Uh, but overall, this is a contribution to G minus two. And this particular contribution is at the level 10 to the minus 11. So this is not yet quite resolved by the G minus two experiment, but almost. And the Higgs on its own and the top on its own contributes more than this. And so we can uh, again say that all particles contribute in a relevant way to AMU. Okay, and this is the current status. Um, as I said, I don't discuss here the full standard model theory prediction, but it exists and it is uh, worked on by a worldwide so-called theory initiative collaboration, which has produced uh, this standard model value um, in advance of the G minus two experiment. And uh, comparing the two, we have this 4.2 sigma deviation. And this is, of course, a tantalizing hint for physics beyond the standard model, uh, which will be the focus of the rest of the talk. But before we go there, let me mention, I assume that most of you know that uh, there exists a new um, calculation of certain standard model contributions coming from lattice gauge theory. And uh, if you take for granted this new uh, lattice gauge theory calculation, and forget about the previous standard model evaluation, then the 4.2 sigma is reduced to two sigma. And uh, so this uh, lattice gauge theory calculation is now under scrutiny and there will be further progress uh, for sure in the next few years along with further progress from the experiment. But um, we can discuss what uh, uh, slightly shifted standard model theory prediction would mean for the implications, but for now I will stick to this uh, 4.2 sigma. Okay, let me start by making some general remarks. So in absolute terms, the standard model prediction is too low by 25 times 10 to the minus 10. And the uncertainty is plus minus six. So this is the 4.2 sigma deviation. So you can ask yourself, is this a large uh, or a small deviation? And actually, uh, my first comment is, you should consider this a large deviation. It's a large discrepancy. Namely, you should compare it to the standard model weak contributions. And as I said, the standard model weak contributions are 10 to the minus nine. 
and uh, the deviation is uh, 2.5 times 10 to the minus nine. So it's about two times larger than the standard model weak contributions. But on the other hand, you always expect a mass square suppression. Therefore, it's not automatically obvious how new physics could explain such a 200% effect, essentially. Uh, in particular, it's not obvious how it could do it uh, while you know that uh, many, many other experiments at colliders and elsewhere agree. Um, and so how can you have a 200% effect in G minus two, but essentially no effect in all other observables? And the way to think about this is uh, complementarities. G minus two has certain specific properties which make it kind of unique compared to many other observables. And so G minus two is loop induced. It is CP conserving, flavor conserving, and chirality flipping. And so the fact that it is loop induced makes it complementary to collider observables. Remember at collider observables, you always need uh, to be able to detect final state particles. And so the detectors must be sensitive enough. Uh, you shouldn't have too much background. Whereas in loop induced processes or in, in these um, quantum fluctuation processes like G minus uh, two, any particle which exists in the loop will inevitably contribute to G minus two. Then, uh, the CP and flavor conserving nature makes G minus two complementary to many observables that are familiar at low energies. For example, there are electric dipole moment measurements. There is B to S gamma, mu to E gamma and so on. These are low energy uh, observables which depend on very similar Feynman diagrams, but they violate CP and they violate flavor. And it's of course very much possible that new physics um, is essentially CP conserving and flavor conserving, and then new physics would contribute only to G minus two, but not to those other observables. Then uh, G minus two is chirality flipping. I explained this already. This is very important for its phenomenology, it means that we connect left and right handed muons. And that is different, for example, in electroweak precision observables, uh, which are chirality conserving and where we have, of course, excellent agreement between standard model theory and experiment. So thinking about these complementarities, you can kind of uh, guess that in order to explain the 200% effect in G minus two, you need to go to specific models. And uh, within those models, you need to go to specific parameter regions where you maximally exploit these complementarities. And so that means completely generically, it's not easy to explain the G minus two deviation, but in specific models, it is absolutely possible. So here again is this central formula where we have in particular those green factors, WEF and chirality flipping parameter uh, related to the muon mass generation, which come from uh, the necessity of chirality flips and electroweak symmetry breaking. And uh, Again, as a comparison, those green factors in the standard model, uh, they are just unique and they amount to the muon mass itself. And so therefore, uh, we can have this formula in mind while discussing concrete examples. All right, so let us go to some examples. And I would say there are two particularly promising directions for BSM physics in the explanation of G minus two. I would almost claim that, uh, loosely speaking, you can categorize all uh, BSM proposals into those two categories. So uh, the first um, category or the first open question, which is connected to G minus two is dark matter or dark sectors. So uh, the question is, uh, what is the nature of dark matter? What is the dark matter particle? How uh, is dark matter composed? And in particular, what are the interactions of uh, the dark matter particle? For sure, we know that dark matter particles cannot interact with photons. Maybe they also cannot interact with hadrons, but dark matter particles could interact with muons. If dark matter particles interact with muons, then inevitably they would contribute to G minus two via loops. 
And uh, then, of course, again, we have this complementarity because clearly dark matter particles are hard to see in detectors, and therefore uh, it's um, understandable that we haven't seen them uh, explicitly in any past experiment, but they could be the explanation of the G minus two result. So uh, this is the general idea, and you can do quite systematic and broad studies of uh, dark matter models contributing to G minus two. And if you do such a generic study, uh, which for example, we have done, but also other people, you can find that uh, out of all quantum field theories, only certain quantum numbers of dark matter models are actually viable. And for example, if you restrict yourself to uh, models, quantum field theory models, which contain only two new fields compared to the standard model, then it's uh, actually not possible to describe dark matter and G minus two simultaneously. Nevertheless, the general idea remains very interesting. And so let me give you a few examples. So on the left, you see here a plot from a recent paper by a Spanish collaboration, which consider Z prime models. Z prime are, uh, if you want dark sector particles, it's a neutral new spin one H boson. And uh, if uh, among all possible Z prime quantum numbers, what is particularly interesting is this L mu minus L tau quantum number where the Z prime couples only to muons and to tau leptons, but not to anything else. And so of course, in that way, you explain why you have not seen this Z prime in previous E plus E minus collisions and why you do not see it at the LHC but it couples to the muon and therefore it could contribute to G minus two via such a simple one loop diagram. And uh, the plot uh, at the top shows you that there are already very many constraints on uh, such a Z prime model from low energy experiments like Babar and um, uh, many other low energy measurements. But there is a window um, which is promising where you can explain G minus two in such a Z prime scenario. And the window has a Z prime masses around the muon mass, like 10 MeV to 100 MeV. That is the correct mass window. So Z prime with this mass and this quantum number can explain G minus two. And actually there is also another recent paper um, where uh, this Z prime is then embedded into a bigger framework where you can then explain dark matter G minus two and also some B physics anomalies and neutrino masses in a unified way. But um, as I said before, you cannot do this, all of this in a model with only two new particles. So this framework contains a Z prime, it contains two leptoquarks and three right-handed neutrinos and a dark matter particle, but uh, all is connected we are the new Z prime <laughs> quantum number. And uh, so this is a promising scenario. There was a noise. Is there a question? Okay, feel free to interrupt. Otherwise, I will just go on. So on the right, um, you have a plot from this uh, generic model analysis with two new fields where you extend the standard model by one new fermion and one new scalar. And so if you have two new fields, one of them might be a dark matter or a dark sector particle and the other one, uh, some other new particle, you can have just simple loop diagrams like the one on the lower left, where you have one new fermion and one new scalar in the loop and uh, the two together couple to the muon and in this way you get contributions to G minus two. And so these contributions behave in a very simple way. Um, you see it here in the sketch. They behave like muon mass square divided by the new physics mass square times some coupling square. And so here this remark applies that it's not easy to generate sufficiently large contributions. What you need is rather low masses and very, very large couplings. And so on the plot on the right, you see this example. The coupling strength is 3.5. So this is a very large coupling, but still um, compatible with perturbation theory. And the masses that are relevant are 100 to 200 GeV for both of these two new particles. And so um, this parameter region and this mass region is of course already constrained by the LHC, but it's not excluded. The LHC is not sensitive if the mass splitting is small. 
and uh, therefore uh, this window of two light um, and similar in mass particles exists and is a promising way to explain the current g minus two uh, result. Uh, is Excuse me. You, you can go on. Okay, let's, let's have the question. Ah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, is the mass is uh, in MEV or in JEV? On the right plot, the mass is in yeah. GEV. Oh, yeah, okay. Sorry, good question. Yeah. Uh, the, the, on the right GEV. plot, it's GEV. On the left, it's MEV. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Yes, on the right, okay. it's GEV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, okay. Right, okay. and so as I mentioned before, it's not possible to explain G minus two and dark matter simultaneously. So uh, in this plot, you see that uh, this particular model uh, contains a dark matter candidate, but uh, mm -hmm. the parameter region where you explain dark matter is the red line. And this mm -hmm. is unfortunately excluded by the LHC. Mm -hmm. Therefore, uh, if you want to be in the uh, window, which is allowed by LHC, you uh, cannot explain dark matter simultaneously. However, uh, as I mentioned, uh, even more complicated models uh, are also motivated where you have a more elaborate dark sector and then this could be a part of such more elaborate models. And so this provides a promising way to explain G minus two. And here there is a connection to um, E plus E minus colliders. So for the left model where we have MEV particles, um, I am honestly not aware of um, a promising way how these models could be investigated at an E plus E minus collider. However, for the right models, uh, there are kind of obvious uh, possibilities because you would have processes that will definitely be possible. You could have E plus E minus to mu plus mu minus. And uh, then the muon couples to these two new particles to a new scalar or to a new boson and a new fermion with a large coupling strength of 3.5. Therefore, you will have this process where E plus E minus goes into one muon and the two new physics particles. And if the masses of them are between one and 200 GeV, this is a possible process even at a 350 GeV collider. Similarly, one of the two particles obviously must carry electric charge. So, um, and then you will also have the process E plus E minus going via photon to a pair of these new charged particles and you can investigate that as well. Then um, that is not necessarily the case, but it can be the case that the new particles also couple to the electron, not only to the muon. If they couple also to the electron, then you have also one loop corrections from box diagrams to processes like E plus E minus to mu plus mu minus directly. And by measuring these processes precisely enough, you could be sensitive to these new physics box contributions and in this way disentangle or um, constrain the new physics. Dominic, uh, yeah? the, the, the reference for the model to the right is the same as the one to the left? No, the reference to the model on the right uh, is from our own paper. Uh, so whenever I say nothing, it's from our own paper. From uh, last year, April. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Good. Some conclusions on uh, this uh, set of dark matter models or dark sector models. So as I said, it's not completely trivial to accommodate G minus two and dark matter simultaneously. Uh, but if we do not only talk about dark matter, but about dark sectors, then it's uh, very plausible to have models like the left with a Z prime, uh, which you might call a dark sector particles or models like the one on the right uh, embedded into a bigger framework, which are both promising and uh, theoretically motivated. The mass range for these models is between 10 MeV for the one on the left up to 200 GeV for this large class of models on the right. Okay, let me come to the second uh, connection of G minus two and uh, big open questions. That is the question of the muon mass generation mechanism. So you can ask how is the muon mass generated? Um, and that means on the one hand, what is the origin of electroweak symmetry breaking? 
what sets the scale of the Higgs uh, field and the Higgs mass, but also what is the origin of Yukawa couplings, what is the origin of Yukawa sectors, and maybe even what is the origin of the generations of quarks and leptons. And so in the standard model, of course, the picture for the muon mass is uh, very complicated. Actually, you first need a Higgs field, then the Higgs field must condense because of a Mexican head potential. Then uh, via Yukawa couplings, the muon couples to this Higgs field. So a very, very specific and complicated structure. And obviously, in many new physics models, this structure changes because uh, many new physics models uh, contain a more complicated electrobic symmetry breaking sector or a more complicated Yukawa sector. And in all such models, you might get very strong and large contributions to G minus two because this connection to the muon mass gives rise to this chirality flip and can lead to a largely enhanced chirality flipping factors in the contributions. So let me give you some examples for that as well. And the simplest example is uh, maybe one of the most familiar one is the two Higgs doublet model. The two Higgs doublet model is a, the minimal way how you can have a more complicated Higgs sector than in the standard model. Instead of one doublet, you have two doublets and along with it, you have a very, very rich and uh, complicated Yukawa sector. As many of you will know, you can constrain the Yukawa sector in various ways by discrete symmetries. And then there are certain types of the two Higgs doublet model. There is what we call type one, type two, type X uh, two Higgs doublet model. For example, supersymmetry predicts a type two, two Higgs doublet model, but all the other types exist as well. And they contain different structures of Yukawa couplings. And uh, some general class which contains all of those types is what we call aligned or flavor aligned two Higgs doublet model. Okay, and this two Higgs doublet model is actually a promising explanation of G minus two as well. However, not in all types. At the bottom, you see type two is in red. So type two cannot explain G minus two of the muon, but uh, type X can do it. And the more general flavor aligned two Higgs doublet model also is a promising explanation of the G minus two result. So type X, by the way, uh, means that we have lepton specific Yukawa couplings. One Higgs doublet gives mass to the leptons. The other Higgs doublet gives mass to the quarks. And in this way, uh, the lepton Yukawa couplings are enhanced by 10 beta. And if 10 beta is large, you get large contributions to G minus two, but not uh, large effects in the quark sector and therefore not large uh, limits from the LHC. Okay, so how is, does the G minus two explanation work? You have these two loop bar Z diagrams again, where you have a Higgs to gamma gamma interaction. And here um, it's a new Higgs, the A0, the CP odd Higgs from the two X doublet model, which connects the muon to a loop, for example, to a tau loop, or it could also be a top quark loop or a bottom quark loop. And if the Yukawa coupling of the new Higgs to leptons is large, then this bar Z diagram is enhanced. In this type X model, the lepton Yukawa couplings are enhanced by 10 beta, and then this diagram would be proportional to 10 beta square. And then even though it's two loop and therefore suppressed, it can be large enough to explain G minus two. But uh, there are all, lots of constraints on this scenario from colliders and from B physics and also from tau lepton physics. And so the, the simplest constraint comes from the LHC. So if the new Higgs couples not only to leptons, but also to quarks, then you could have gluon gluon fusion via top loop into a new Higgs and the new Higgs then decays into tau tau. So that, this would be an observable process at the LHC and therefore uh, you get constraints on the Yukawa couplings and uh, you basically get upper limits on the maximum values of all the Yukawa couplings of this new Higgs. Therefore, it's not trivial uh, that you can actually find a viable parameter space where you can explain G minus two, but this is possible. And this is shown on the right. So the plot uh, shows you in green, again, the G minus two band. And uh, obviously um, this uh, black, red and blue contours show you what is possible 
in the two extracted model. And you see that you can explain the current G minus two result if the mass of this new Higgs is between 20 GeV and about 100 GeV. And this becomes possible if you really maximize all the Yukawa couplings against the existing constraints from all the other measurements. Okay, so this is very promising again. And so you see here uh, an interesting mass window for a new Higgs boson between 20 and 100 GeV. So, uh, okay, and uh, as I said, this is uh, under pressure already because you see uh, the maximum G minus two that you could explain would be around 50 times 10 to the minus 10. And the current G minus two value is uh, 25 times 10 to the minus 10. So it's just possible right now but uh, the parameter space will shrink if the LHC constraints become stronger, if constraints from B physics become stronger and from tau physics become stronger. And so in fact, this scenario is also testable at an E plus E minus collider. And there was a dedicated paper on this by Chun and Mondal already two years ago, or three years ago. And uh, uh, they, um, uh, discussed this what they call Yukawa process where you have E plus E minus into tau tau. And uh, as I said, the U Higgs couples strongly to leptons in particular strongly to the tau lepton. Therefore you can have a process tau tau plus a new Higgs in the final state. And then this new Higgs would decay again into a tau pair. So you have a four tau final state uh, with specific kinematic uh, distributions and um, analyzing this they showed that any plus E minus collider can test the entire scenario uh, for which is of interest for G minus two. So here you see that uh, the plot is made for uh, an ILC with 250 GeV center of mass energy. And uh, with 2000 inverse femtobahn, you can exclude uh, the entire parameter region of interest for G minus two. So that is nice and promising. Let me come to a next scenario with enhanced chirality flips and a connection to the muon mass and uh, electroweak symmetry breaking, namely supersymmetry. Supersymmetry is of course uh, very famous as a scenario which is motivated by making the Higgs more natural and having natural electroweak symmetry breaking. And supersymmetry is also well known as a good and promising explanation of G minus two. In supersymmetry, you have the super partners of all the standard model particles. And for G minus two, what is important are actually three super partners. You need a super partner of the muon, obviously, but you also need the super partners to the Higgs and to the gauge bosons. So you need the Higgs Enos and the Enos, for example, or Enos. If you combine it all in Feynman diagrams, then you find that the diagrams are enhanced by tangent beta, because what these diagrams actually do in, in a way is that they couple the muon via loops to the wrong Higgs boson. You know, in supersymmetry, you have two Higgs doublets. Again, at three level, the muon only couples to one of them with a, um, uh, the one with the small vacuum expectation value, but via a loop, the muon can also couple to the other Higgs with a large vacuum expectation value, and this gives rise to a 10 beta enhancement. And because of this 10 beta enhancement, um, it is well known to be promising to explain G minus two for SUSI masses uh, at the order of a few hundred GeV. So here I plot a rough formula. So if 10 beta is 50, then you can explain the current G minus two for 500 GeV SUSI masses. If 10 beta is 10, you can explain the current G minus two for 200 GeV. So the mass is, so it's a very interesting and promising mass range. And of course the question is, is this mass range allowed by the LHC? And surprisingly, the answer is yes. So the region of interest for G minus two is actually viable. So um, here on the right, you see a plot already. And um, we look here at one particular scenario where we have a so-called Bino-like LSP. That means we also have a dark matter candidate and uh, this Bino-like LSP is the dark matter candidate. 
we have what is called slepton co-annihilation. So there is a small mass splitting between the LSP and the next two lightest two C particle, which is a slepton. And because of this small mass splitting, we have co-annihilation effects and can explain the dark matter relic density correctly. Okay, and once we are in this uh, dark matter um, co-annihilation region, automatically the LHC becomes very insensitive and therefore the entire plot is allowed by current LHC constraints. And in the green band, we can explain G minus two. And again, you see that means that G minus two is explained simultaneously with dark matter here for uh, masses of certain SUSI particles in the range of around 200 to 500 GeV. Here is a second plot um, which shows a little bit different SUSI scenarios. So here um, in the upper corner of the plot shows the same parameter scenario than the previous one. But you see, uh, what I didn't tell you is that uh, in the previous plot, there was one SUSI mass, the so-called Wino mass was fixed at a very high value, one TeV above LHC limits. So if you uh, make the Wino mass lower, then at some point there are LHC constraints. And so uh, Wino mass below 900 GeV is essentially ruled out by the LHC, unless you go again into such a dark matter co-annihilation region if you have really a small mass splitting between the Wino and the dark matter particle, then the LHC becomes insensitive. And so that is the corner at the bottom of the plot. This is a very appealing uh, region of parameter space where you explain dark matter by uh, Wino, Wino co-annihilation. So this is theoretically motivated and it is viable against LHC data. And again, you can perfectly explain G minus two in this parameter region. And so again, so here you have particles in an interesting mass region. And uh, there was also some dedicated um, E plus E minus collider studies in this case by Sven Heinemeyer and collaborators here last year. And let me just show two plots from them. So here first, uh, they have a plot of the cross section of the production of the relevant SUSI particles. And uh, the cross section has values here in the range of picobahn one picobahn down to 10 to the minus two picobahn, but that cross section is high enough that you can easily produce thousands of these particles at all the planned um, colliders if the mass reach is high enough. And so here you see what the mass uh, reach is uh, compared to um, these promising regions. And uh, so the uh, Dots here correspond to a promising regions in SUSI parameter space. For example, the turquoise dots correspond to the parameter region, which I also showed in uh, my plots, this Vino Vino co annihilation region. And so this is a region where you have a mass splitting between the lightest and the next to lightest SUSI particle of around 10, 20 GeV. Then the LHC is uh, not yet really sensitive to this, but in the future it might become sensitive. But clearly, um, uh, the absolute masses of these SUSI particles, which are of interest, are in the ballpark of 200 GeV up to around 5 or 600 GeV. Therefore, with a 350 GeV E plus E minus collider, you will be able to um, test part of this parameter space, but not all of it. And uh, there are a few other uh, very appealing scenarios, so-called xeno like LSP or Wino like LSP. They behave similarly. And for each of them, there is a certain um, mass gap between the lightest and the next to lightest SUSI particle, which is in the ballpark of one or around five GeV. And uh, the absolute masses are of interest in the region between 100 and 500 GeV approximately. And so again, um, first stages of E plus E minus colliders could test part of the parameter space and later stages could actually test uh, practically the entire parameter region. Let me also mention leptoquarks. So a um, third uh, kind of model, which is of interest here for G minus two just to uh, see also some, some other behaviors. Leptoquarks are very promising explanations of G minus two 
However, they are promising in a mass region of around two TeV. So uh, you need quite heavy laptop walks in order to circumvent LHC limits. But if you are in this ballpark of two TeV laptop walk masses, you can nevertheless explain G minus two very nicely. And so uh, that would make it, of course, not so easy to discover such laptop walks also at an E plus E minus collider. Nevertheless, uh, laptop quark models are of theoretical interest. That is what, why I wanted to show them here. So the fine, sorry, the Feynman diagrams for laptop quarks are shown on the bottom. And here you would have a muon coming in. Then a laptop quark would mediate a coupling to the top quark. And uh, the top quark undergoes a chirality flip. And so in this way, you have a very, very strong enhancement of these so-called chirality flips because the chirality is flipped at the top quark Yukawa coupling instead of the muon Yukawa coupling. And that essentially generates a factor 1000 enhancement. And because of this 1000 enhancement, you can explain G minus two for two TeV laptop quark masses. Okay. Um, let me also mention that there is a variety of models which have a behavior which is loosely similar to laptop quarks. For example, there are so-called vector-like lepton models, which also have such a very strong enhancements of chirality flips. And um, I don't want to go into detail, but there uh, are various studies of vector-like lepton models where you also show that you can explain G minus two in interesting mass regions. However, for those, um, uh, the, the situation is a little bit complicated and certain scenarios are already excluded by the LHC while others are not. And um, uh, people are currently looking at masses of these vector-like lepton models, which are even higher than the masses of um, lepton quarks. Okay, so summary for this part. Um, there are very interesting physics questions like what is the origin of electroweak symmetry breaking the Higgs fermion masses and the origin of generations. And for sure, these are questions which are of very high importance for E plus E minus colliders. But also G minus two can say a lot about models which um, are of interest in this uh, region. And so there is a complementarity there. And I mentioned here SUSI models to Higgs doublet model laptop quark models and so on. And the interesting mass range for those uh, particles is between 20 GeV for the new Higgs in the two HDM up to two TeV for the laptop quark models. Okay, now I would like to ask uh, maybe the organizers, do I have five more minutes to explain maybe this slide as well, which yes. might be of interest? Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, so. In all the examples that we have seen so far, um, the masses of the new particles were below 2 TeV. Let me just explain why that is not an accident. And so there is in general kind of this order of magnitude upper limit of 2 TeV. This is the maximum mass that you can reasonably have in new physics models to explain G minus two. And so we start again from this uh, generic formula where we have the muon mass explicitly, then these green factors for chirality flips and electroweak symmetry breaking, and some other couplings and the mass square suppression. I told you that in the standard model, these green factors are just the muon mass itself. And in a variety of new physics models, the same is true. So for example, in certain of these dark matter models, um, the green factors are just the muon mass like in the standard model. If that is the case, then this generic formula simply looks like muon mass square divided by new physics mass square times couplings. And the couplings are typically loop suppressed. And if you plug in numbers, then you see that in order to explain the current G minus two value, you can do it in such models only if the mass is below around 200 GeV. And that was the case in those examples of dark sector or dark matter models. The masses are never really higher than uh, 200 GeV. And then you have processes like E plus E minus two mu mu, and the mu uh, splits into two of those new physics particles with a mass below 200 GeV. So that is interesting. However, in general, uh, you can have these green factors which are different uh, from the standard model case. And then there is the following argument. 
I told you in the beginning that the G minus two and the muon mass, they behave very similarly. So the same green factors that um, contribute to G minus two, they would also contribute to the muon mass and the couplings as well. Therefore, in models where you have such new chirality flips, for instance, SUSE, Twix, Doublet model, leptoquarks, and so on, you have simultaneously a new contribution to the muon mass from new physics loops. And if you require that uh, the new physics contribution to the muon mass is not bigger than the muon mass itself. In other words, you will require that there is no fine tuning in the muon mass between loop effects and the three level muon mass. Then you can plug in again uh, this constraint and you get a formula for G minus two, which tells you that you can only explain the current deviation if the new physics mass is below around two TeV. And that was the case in all the examples. That means that in all these examples, this constraint uh, for the muon mass BSM contributions was actually fulfilled. And so it's a general argument that uh, sort of reasonable models, if you want, uh, can only explain G minus two if the masses are up to two TeV. I wish I could say, that uh, the mass can only be up to, uh, I don't know, 350 GeV, so that you can inevitably observe them at the 350 GeV E plus E minus collider, but that is not the case, unfortunately, but we have this uh, upper limit, which is uh, one order of magnitude higher. Okay, so here I have a list of uh, processes uh, just for you to, I don't know, um, to discuss or to uh, keep in mind. So we have, the possibility of light neutral particles, Z prime with a mass of in the MeV region, we could have light new Higgses with a mass of uh, tens of GeV. And with a light new Higgses, we could have this Yukawa process E plus E minus to tau tau A going into four tau final states, which is of interest. Then we have this uh, range of models with simply two new particles, a boson and a fermion. One of them must be charged. And then uh, the couplings typically must be quite significant. And therefore you have this process E plus E minus going to muon plus these two new particles uh, or uh, E plus E minus going to a pair of the new charged particles. If uh, the new particles also couple to electrons, which is uh, often the case, but not always, you also get box contributions to uh, processes like E plus E minus to mu mu which can be precisely measured. And uh, these chirality flip enhanced models like SUSE, leptoquarks, they of course always contain such new bosons, new fermions like the smuon or the lightest SUSE particle or the leptoquark and so on. But in those models, the masses uh, tend to go up to 2 TeV as I explained. All right, so that brings me to the conclusions. Uh, from the point of view of G minus two, we have a very precise standard model prediction where interestingly all known standard model particles and interactions are relevant. And uh, this worldwide theory initiative uh, is an ongoing effort which will produce more and more precise numbers throughout the next few years. For BSM, uh, we have this interesting situation that we need this uh, large effect, larger than the weak contributions but that is possible because of all these complementarities and thinking about the complementarities, you see that there are interesting connections to dark sectors, dark matter, or to chirality flip enhancements and models, which uh, explain the muon mass or electroweak symmetry breaking. And uh, all those models, which I have shown you in examples, they are typically constrained by many um, experiments already. Higgs coupling measurements are of interest, E physics is of interest, lepton flavor violation is of interest, EDM, light particle searches, but of course they can also be constrained by an E plus E minus collider. I wish I could say uh, all of them can be tested at an E plus E minus collider, but that does not seem to be the case. Let me just mention that actually there are papers that a future muon collider could really exhaustively test all potential explanations of G minus two. So there is a no loose theorem for the muon collider. But for the near future, uh, the Fermi experiment is as I said ongoing. And so throughout the next uh, four or five years, you can expect great progress because the current experimental result uses only 6% of the ultimate data. 
Therefore, uh, we will get more precise results and we will learn more about uh, this deviation in G minus two of the mu. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Nolan. Thanks a lot. And this was extremely clear overview um, of the G minus two options uh, for new physics. So now we open the floor to questions, comments, I see one mic is on and it's in the, the head now, Alain, please. 